an Islamic eschatological analysis of the origin and destiny of modern Western civilization. And I am using the English language, so I assume that you can all understand me in English. If I were to attempt to speak in Urdu, you'd be laughing for the rest of the evening. I don't know of anyone, I do not know of anyone who has ever lectured on this subject. If there is such a person, I don't know him. So you're probably listening to this topic for the first time in your life. And before we proceed to define Western civilization, let us explain that this is an Islamic eschatological analysis, not the political analysis that you get from a university classroom. And as an Islamic analysis, it has to be founded on the Book of Allah, the Quran. Let that be clear. The Book of Allah declares of itself, بَعَلَوْزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِنَّهُ لَخَقُّ الْيَكِينِ that in this book, there is absolute truth. Absolute truth does not exist elsewhere. We cannot say of the Hadith, while the Hadith is very important, we cannot say of the Hadith that it has the same status as the Quran. It is only the Quran which is absolute truth. So while the Hadith is important, it is with absolute truth in the Quran that we must judge the Hadith. Does anyone differ before we proceed? <laughs> I have news for you. I just made this statement here in Glasgow before this audience and no one is deferring with me. If I had made the same statement 50, 60, 70 years ago, everybody would defer with me. <laughs> yes. I am past 80 years of age, so I know more than you know. <laughs> and so the Hadith while it is important, does not have the same status as the Qur'an. And our methodology is that we use the Qur'an to judge the Hadith. And nobody differs with me. If the Hadith is in harmony with the Qur'an, we accept it. If the Hadith is in conflict with the Qur'an, we stay with the Qur'an. But if the Hadith is neither in harmony nor in conflict, we accept it. But it does not have the same status. It has a lower status. And we will not use such Hadith for a boxing match. We will not use such a Hadith to divide the Ummah and create a new sectarian movement. We would not do that. And then what about the commentaries of the Quran, known as the tafasir, plural of tafsir, commentaries of the Quran. They do not have the status of absolute truth, do they? If the Hadith does not have the status of absolute truth, can the commentaries of the Quran have that status? No, they cannot. So it is with the Quran that we we'll judge the tafsir. One last comment. The Quran is the miraculous word 
We believe that it is the word of Allah Most High. Can you translate the miraculous word of Allah to another language? Is there anyone who believes it can be done in this gathering? No. You do? No, we can translate from Arabic to English. My question is, Everybody, even the schoolboy knows that there's only one Quran and it's in Arabic. Even the schoolboy knows that. There's only one Quran and it is in Arabic. There is only one Quran and it is in Arabic. I don't have to keep on repeating that. So my question is, can the miraculous word of Allah be translated to another language? No, it can it states it in the Quran itself that it's been revealed in Arabic, Arabia. Yes, the Quran is in Arabic. Nobody defers to that. But we want to know whether it is possible to translate, not to explain. Eh? We're talking about translation. Is it possible to translate the miraculous word of Allah from Arabic? to another language. My view, and you should not accept my view at all, unless you are convinced that it is correct. My view is, no, it's not possible. You cannot translate the Quran from this Arabic text to any other language. But what you can do is to explain the Quran in different languages. And when you explain the Quran, you must always be humble enough intellectually to admit that this may not be all that Allah is saying. I am making an offense. I am making an effort to explain the Quran. But the knowledge that is in the Quran is is uh, infinite. There must be much more, much more than what I am conveying to you. We must be humble enough to say that. So then can the tafsir of the Quran exhaust the knowledge that is contained in the Quran? No. You understand the meaning of the word exhaust? <clears throat> For many of you, English is your second language. But some of you born in this language, in this country, English is your mother tongue. <laughs> Can the tafsir exhaust the knowledge that is in the Quran? No. No, it cannot. So let us quote down for the second time. Let us quote the Quran. And this is in Surah al kaf of the Quran. And be careful with Surah al kaf because this is the surah par excellence of Akhiru Zaman. Akhiru Zaman, the end time. And you know what Allah has said about the end time, don't you? He uses only one small surah to deliver, <laughs> to deliver the mother of all warnings about Akhir Zaman. Listen. Ba'alawuza billahi min ash-shaytani rajim wal asr. And we take an oath, qasam, by the passage of time when it reaches the late afternoon of history, asr. At that time, inna al-insan fi khusr, mankind would be in a state of loss. Uh, I would like to add something more to the Quran here, my own, particularly the politicians. Particularly the politicians. Mankind would be in a state of loss, drifting. The wind blows this way, they move this way. The wind blows that way, they move that way. Drifting. 
in a state of loss, going nowhere. All of mankind, except in the Lavina Amanu, except those who have faith, and faith is not sold in the stock market. And who are righteous in conduct. What a wassail will hock. And who stand together, who exhort each other, let's stand together for truth. Absolute truth in the Quran. Let us live for that truth, regardless of the price we have to pay. But to us, I will be sovereign. When you stand up for truth, they're going to come after you. So you have to be able to show patience. This is the explanation in the Quran that is most important of all to explain. Akhiru Zaman. And now listen to what Allah says about the word of Allah, particularly at this time in Akhiru Zaman. لو كان البحر مدادا لكلمات ربي if all if the seas all became ink and you use that ink to explain the words of Allah لنفد البحر قبل أن تنفد كلمات ربي your ink will be exhausted before you can explain what is contained in the word of Allah. And so the tafsir cannot exhaust the knowledge and the wisdom in the Quran. So now, can we proceed? I've made these introductory comments so that no one will stand up at the end of this lecture and make a fool of himself. <laughs> a gentle warning. Modern Western civilization had a name previously to this. I don't know if you're aware of it. They call themselves Christendom. Christendom. Uh, do we have any tissue paper over here? About the tissue? They call themselves Christendom, meaning the land of Christians. And, uh, excuse me. Not only that this was Christendom, but this was, this was the leader of the Christian world. These were the Christians who led the world of Christianity, this Christendom. It was in this part of Europe, which was Christendom, that a Pope could launch a war, declare war, could raise an army. And a Pope could send an army hundreds and thousands of miles away in in crusades to liberate Jerusalem and the Holy Land. This was Christendom. And so when we want to offer analysis, an analysis of the <coughs> origin of modern Western civilization, what I'm doing here is I'm trading the young scholars who tomorrow will dazzle, will dazzle the world with their scholarship. That's what I'm doing, training you. When we want to analyze the origin of modern Western civilization, the implication is you have to commence with the Christian world. Modern Western civilization 
can no longer be considered to be a Christian civilization. Not when a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. Are you still Christians? The Lord God has declared so many times that he created us from a male and a female. He mentions only two genders. And now this civilization is telling us that the Lord God was inadequate in his, in his explanation of gender. And the, the, this civilization is now giving to the world a new philosophy of gender, which takes us beyond the male and the female. Because <laughs> the Pakistan National Assembly doesn't know that. When we go to the Christian world, what Europe used to be before it became what now is essentially a godless civilization. What does the Quran have to, uh, to say to explain to us? And uh, the surah that is most important of all with which to study the subject, to begin your study, is Surah to Rum. Surah to Rum. The word Rum occurs only once in the whole Quran. And so we have a lesson to learn that every single word in the Quran is important. Sometimes a single word is enough for Allah to provide guidance. So be careful, don't rush. Let the river of knowledge flow at its own speed. I learned that lesson. <laughs> I learned that lesson in life as a young man. Let the river of knowledge flow at its own speed. And Allah speaks, and He says, Alif Lam Mim. And these are not letters of the alphabet which have been explained by the Quran. Nor have they been explained by he who was sent to teach the Quran. So when we offer an explanation, it would be an interpretation, not an explanation. And we say Allah knows best. If you go to my book, uh, Methodology for the Study of the Quran, you will find what are my views on Alif Lam Mim and so on, the alphabets. room. Rome has been defeated. In a land close by. I don't think Chicago will qualify as a land close by. Huh? Or Buenos Aires will qualify. Or Puerto Rico will qualify. <laughs> it is a land close by to this land in which the Qur'an is coming down. So Rome has been defeated in that land close by. وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ But a divine prophecy is now declared that within that this defeat will now be followed with a victory. The defeat will be followed by victory. She be seen in just a few years' time. The Lahil Amr, the power and the authority to grant victory 
in a war. The power and authority is with Allah. And he has exercised his power and authority to grant victory min kabul wa min bad. The room will be victorious twice. That is the context. There's no other context than this. Room will be victorious twice. Not that room will be victorious once, and somebody else will be victorious a second time. That is inadmissible. <coughs> it is room who will be victorious twice. But the language is strange. The first victory is before. Before what? Allah is inviting you to think. He has sent down this Quran, Likawmi Atafakkarun, to people who think. And that, marv <laughs> that marvelous scholar, oh my gosh, they could throw all the stones they wanted him. He still continues to dazzle the world. Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, he said, he said, this, this Ummah has stopped thinking 500 years ago. But when I went to Pakistan last year, I believe, they said to me, Sheikh Ram, he didn't say 500, he said 300. <laughs> this Ummah has stopped thinking. 300 years ago. I love it, Iqbal. I love it. <laughs> that you have a man with that kind of courage to take on the whole Ummah and declare you stop thinking. I love it. But Allah says, I have sent this Quran to people who think. And that's what we're not doing anymore. So if I am to plant a seed here in Glasgow, for his car to emerge tomorrow will dazzle the world. You've got to be able to think. Why does Allah use the word before? You have two victories. One is before, min kabul, and the other is after, min bad. And then he says about both these victories, on both occasions, the believers who follow Muhammad we will celebrate. So we have two questions now to ask. Number one, who is room? And number two, what is there between before and after? Before, barely say, after, bad. What does it mean bad in, in Urdu? Bad, bad me, bad me, bad me. <coughs> Let us take the first question. Who is room? Orthodox oh. Christians. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salam had a companion. Who was very wealthy and his name was Abu Bakr and Nabi Muhammad gave him the title Siddiq, the truth, truthful one. And when this revelation came down, the Arabs of Mecca who rejected the message of the Prophet Islam, they were contemptuous because they identified with the Persian Empire, which had defeated the Byzantine Empire. And that this <coughs> revelation is coming to say that within a few years, this 
this victory of the Persian Empire against the Byzantine Empire is going to be reversed and the Byzantine Empire is going to be victorious? This is nonsense. And Abu Bakr Siddiq couldn't take that. So he said, you want a bet? Well, I don't know whether they're the ones who provoked him with a bet. He said, I'll take the bet. And they took a bet. And when the Prophet heard about it, he said, Abu Bakr, change that bet. <coughs> change it. Because when the Quran says that this victory will come it means between three and nine. So Abu Bakr Siddiq changed the bet. And what was prophesied in the Quran was fulfilled. And the Byzantine Empire reversed the defeat and defeated Persia. This is very plain and clear and all students understand this and accept this. And so Rome is the Christian Byzantine Empire that was based in Constantinople. That is the only answer. And that Christian empire which was based in Constantinople, despite corruptions which occurred in their belief system, was still held by Allah. Bi Nasrillahi, bi Nasrillahi and Surumayyasha. Allah help them and Allah can help whomsoever he wishes. Allah help them to be victorious. And more than that, that when they were victorious, even Nabi Muhammad Islam celebrated. So Rome is Constantinople. The Byzantine Empire, which is based in Constantinople. That is Rome. When we go to the Hadith, however, you can find other things. But remember, it is with the Quran that you will judge the Hadith when you do your research now. Don't come to me and tell me, but look, the Quran says, but look what the Hadith said. Don't tell me that, because I expect you. I expect you to show integrity, show intellectual acumen, and use the Quran to judge the Hadith. Now let's go to the second question. We've identified Rome as the Christian Byzantine Empire based in Constantinople, which earned Allah's help, which was favored by Allah. And uh, when Allah helped them and they were they were victorious, even the Prophet celebrated. But before we go to the second question, what were the beliefs of these Christians in Constantinople at the time when the Quran was revealed? This should be about 600 years after the time of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. I don't think anyone in this hall will differ with me. That the great battle which was fought had already been fought and those Christians who were emphatic that the son of Mary, Jesus, the son of Mary, Nabi Isa Islam, was not God. He was a prophet of the Lord God. And the Lord God was one God. Those Christians had been defeated. That's the uh, Council of Nicaea. <clears throat> they used the Council of Nicaea to destroy that part of the Christian world. And uh, 
an alternative image from Nicaea, which was now confirmed, and they used the term canonized. The, the Christian faith is based on the Trinity. That there is God the Father, and there is God the Son, who is uh, Jesus, and there is also God the Holy Ghost. But in some, excuse my language, I don't mean to be offensive, in some mysterious way, these three distinct persons, three <coughs> distinct persons, yet are one person. This is the Trinity. This had already been established centuries before the Byzantine Empire was defeated. So Rome in the Quran was already a Christian people who had accepted the Trinity. Don't forget what I said. And don't come with a question at the end of the lecture make a fool of yourself. Be careful, listen to me. So now let's turn to the second question. Two victories, and they must both be victories of Rome, because that is the context. You cannot escape the context. One victory is Min Kabul, Pehadeshe, before. And the other victory is Min Ba'd, Ba'dme, afterwards. It therefore inviting us to think, what is it, what is it that exists between the two? There is something between the two, in consequence of which one victory is before and the other victory is after. Don't come and say, shake away the hadith. Yes, you have people who do that. Shake away the hadith. Because they don't think anymore. And they object when others think. Iqbal was right. Because of the language which is used, min qabl, before, wa min ba'd, after. People who have the capacity to think, elementary capacity to think, would recognize there has to be something in between. And it is in the context of that it is in between the two victories that this one is before and that one is after. Can you find the answer to that question in the Kitab? No, it's not there in the Quran. You have to do your own homework. You have to think, you have to research. And when you come to an answer and you interpret the Quran, be careful. At the beginning of Surah to Ali Imran, Allah speaks and says there are two kinds of verses in the Quran. Only two, not three. The first are those which are plain and clear. You need only to explain it. Muhkamat. But the second are those which have to be interpreted to be understood. Mutashabihat. But he says about the Mutashabihat, I wish I had the time to give you an example of a Mutashabihat, but we have limited time. He says about the Mutashabihat, and this is not only true of the Quran, this is true of the Bible as well, all scriptures, that when you interpret Interpret the Quran as you must do it. Remember, only Allah can confirm that your interpretation is correct. So you must be humble enough to say, Allah knows best. But if your interpretation is correct, then it becomes truth. And truth will survive. Truth will survive. I'm fond of quoting the Arabic proverb, Al-Kafila to Tasir. 
الكافلة تسير والكلاب تنبح The dogs are ba- the dogs are barking but the caravan is still moving on <laughs> so if your interpretation is correct don't bother about the critics it will survive because it's the truth and if you make a mistake as i have made mistakes in the past you still get blessings for having made the effort but you <laughs> your interpretation will go down the river and be forgotten tomorrow so when we make an effort now to understand the terms before and after we're looking for something in between the first victory occurred at the time when nabi muhammad al-islam was alive and in makkah before the hijra The second one has not as yet occurred. We don't know when it will occur. But Rome will be victorious a second time. You could tell that to NATO for me. <laughs> <laughs> Rome, Rome will be victorious a second time and Rome is not Washington. Room is Constantinople. Constantinople? A man cannot marry another man and get a marriage certificate. Not in that Christianity. My view is that the event that occurred between the two, which is a defining event in Christian in Christian um, history. was the great schism which occurred in the year 1054 and it did that schism which places its stamp on Christendom on the west and therefore on modern western civilization Constantinople from the council of Nicaea had consistently declared that the holy spirit in Arabic ruhul qudus that's in the Quran ruhul qudus the holy spirit Constantinople from the council of Nicaea had consistently declared and affirmed that the Holy Spirit comes only from the Father, not from the Son. To this day, to this day, that Christian world declares the same thing. The Holy Spirit comes only from the Father, not from the Son. But in 1054, this breakaway branch of the Christian faith, which came to Rome, declared, "We defer with you." And from now, we declare that the Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son. When Nabi Muhammad Islam declared that he was a prophet of Allah, the Arabs in Mecca said, well, "We always knew you to be such a trustworthy person. We always knew you for all these years to be so honest. We gave you the name Al Amin, and now you tell us that you are a prophet like unto Abraham and Moses." We can't understand this, and you tell us we should not worship all of these gods. There's only one God. So they sent a delegation to the rabbis in the northern city. The name in the Quran of that city, the name in the Quran is Yathrib. In the Quran is Yathrib, 
after the death of the Prophet we chose to give it a new name, Medina. But the name in the Quran is Yatrib. So they sent a delegation to Yatrib, where there was a large community of Jews. The most important rabbis were there. Rabbi, what are you doing here? I don't have the time to answer that question. How can we tell whether this man is truthful or not when he claimed that he's a prophet? And the rabbi said, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer, not even the prime minister can answer it. And in, the, in the aircraft coming from Trinidad at flew by British Airways, and I noticed that the menu was changing. I say your menu is changing like your prime minister's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Ask him these three questions, which only a prophet can answer, only a prophet, no one else. No historian can answer it. One of the three questions was, ask him about the Ruh. What they meant was the Ruh al Kudus, or the Holy Spirit. That was the question. And Allah sent down the answer. <laughs> And the answer which came down in the Quran confirmed what Constantinople was saying and rejected what, what, what Rome and Europe were saying. And they questioned the O Muhammad about the Ruh or the Spirit. Say to them that the Ruh comes from the one God. They call him the Father. We say, no, the one God. The Ruh does not come from Nabi Isa. <clears throat> this is the great schism and the stamp of shirk is now uh, stamped on the face of modern Western civilization, which was Christendom. But this is shirk, blatant shirk. At least Constantinople was still remaining that this is the supreme being. This is the supreme Lord, because the Holy Spirit comes from him and him alone. And the sun does not have that status. So Constantinople, yes, they have the Trinity, but it is not the same kind of shirk or blasphemy as this side of the Christian world, which declares that the Holy Spirit comes from both the Father and the Son. We now leave Surah to the Kaf of the Quran, and we turn to Surah to the Araf. I wish I had more time to go back in history to make this a longer lecture, but we don't have that time. I have to cut. In Surah to the Araf, Allah speaks of a town. A town which was by the sea was Alhum Anil Kuryatid Leti Kanat Hadirat al Bahr. A town by the sea. And in this town there are people. Which surah is this? Arab. And in this town there are people 
who are obliged to obey the law of the Sabbath. What is the law of the Sabbath? The Quran tells us, as other scriptures also say, that Allah created the heavens and the earth, that is careless language on my part, the heavens and the earth, the parallel universes, the Samawat and the earth, the material, the earth means the material universe. <clears throat> In six days, Krishitati Ayam, six days. And of course, these are not six days, meaning 24 hours. These are six periods of time. But on the seventh day, he ordained rest and prayer. So you can't keep your shop open seven days a week. Huh? Do you do that? <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. You have to close your business one day of the week because Allah has ordained this. At least one day of rest and that one day is also a day of prayer. This is the law which came down in the Torah. Do we have anything comparable to that law of the Sabbath? You're prohibited from work on the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day is the last day of the week, not the first. And the last day of the week is Yawmus Sabt, which is called Saturday today. Somebody took somebody for a ride and they change it from Saturday to Sunday. This is gentle language that I'm using. Somebody took somebody for a ride and changed it from Saturday to Sunday. But the day of the Sabbath, the almost up to Saturday. And that law was applicable to the people living in this town by the sea. You don't have to have a PhD to understand that these people who had to obey the law of the Sabbath had to be the Israelite people. But no Israel. Okay? So they were not allowed to fish on the Sabbath day, but this was a city to live by fishing. But Allah chose to test them, <laughs> to test them. Because in a hadith, Nabi Muhammad had given us a hint. And sometimes you have only a hint with which to work, eh? to build your house of knowledge. He spoke about a city which on both sides, two sides was the sea and on the third side was the land, like a triangle. And Banu Ishaq came to that city. He does not use Banu Israel anymore. The term Banu Israel is now discarded. And instead of Banu Israel, you have Ahlul Kitab, you have Al Yahud, you have Al Nasara. And there is in this, this hadith, there is Banu Ishaq, in order to avoid using the term Banu Israel. And they come to the city, and Allah allows them to conquer the city without fighting. All that they say is La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and one, fall, one side falls. And they repeat it and the second time falls. 
and the third one, and they repeat, and the third side falls, and the city becomes their city without fighting. And as they are celebrating their victory, the news reaches them that the Dajjal has been, has been released amongst them. You cannot study the subject of the Dajjal if you are a schoolboy. Be careful. It's a very difficult subject to study. So this is a city where a people live who are obliged to obey the law of the Sabbath, therefore an Israelite people, and therefore who cannot fish on the day of the Sabbath but they live by fishing. But Dajjal has been released amongst them. And so Allah now tests them. Like he tested them when she came with the baby. And they said, Mariam, how could you do such a thing? Meaning, this is your baby, but you're not yet married. They were tested, and because they could see with only the external eye, they were internally blind. She, she was the most virtuous of all women. Mariam, or Mary, who has the highest status of all women in the whole world. And they blamed her because they were blind. Similarly, Allah tested them. And for every day of the week, no fish. And on <laughs> the Sabbath day, fish everywhere. The fish jumping, you could see the fish. What a test, eh? We recently had a test on COVID, but I don't want to upset you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to upset you. And it, it's coming back again for a second time, you come back a third time. And there are those who repeat the mistake three times. <laughs> so, it was a test. Every day of the week, no fish but only on the Sabbath day, plenty fish. It's a test from Allah. And in Surah Al-A'raf, we're told that Dajjal now has infiltrated and corrupted some of them. So now they say, we don't care for the law anymore. The law is not important to us anymore. It's only peanuts. We have the truth. Jesus is the truth. And if you have the truth, you don't need the law. So they went fishing. <laughs> they went fishing on the Sabbath day. And I have a secret to tell you. They're still fishing on, up to now on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> What was the response of Constantinople? Obviously, the town is Constantinople. No other town fits the bill, only Constantinople. I have a book entitled Constantinople in the Quran. I somehow or the other forgot to order a shipment of my stock of books for Glasgow. So I didn't send it. I don't know if you have any here now. I don't know. But um, if the management agrees here, I can come back. I'm spending the whole of Ramadan here in, in Britain. I can come back in Ramadan uh, on a Sunday morning, Yom al and we can have a talk from 10 o'clock in the morning on uh, the Quran and Ramadan, the Quran and Ramadan. What is your duty to the Quran in Ramadan? Okay. And I can have the books shipped up. 
scholarship for that lecture. So after the lecture, your management can tell me whether they want to accept my offer. The town is Constantinople, the town by the sea, with an Israelite people living there. And they were obliged to obey the Sabbath. <coughs> Which Israelite people were there? After Nabi Isa <coughs> al-Islam, the event of the crucifixion, there were some who celebrated We've killed him. <laughs> and these are now known in the Quran as Jews. Remember, I'm saying the definition of a Jew in the Quran is the Israelite people who rejected the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. You can come with other definitions you want, but this is the definition in the book of Allah. But there were others, Israelite people, who were weeping, weeping, because they saw him crucified before their very eyes. They did not know, and nobody knew. If I was there, I, saw, I also would not know. It took 600 years later for the Quran to come down to say no. They did not kill him, they did not crucify. Rather, Allah made it appear that he was crucified. But after the event of the crucifixion, Allah caused Jerusalem to be destroyed and the Jews to be expelled. The Israelite people all were expelled from Jerusalem. But those who rejected the Messiah, he scattered them all <coughs> over the world. So Jews in Argentina and Jews in China and Jews in Finland, Jews all <coughs> over the world. This is in the Quran. Waqata'anahum fil ardi umam. But what about those who were weeping, who believed in Jesus? as the Messiah, Allah did not punish them. Allah allowed them to get, to get this city, Constantinople, to become a Christian city without any fighting. But Mustafa Kamal did not study the Quran. <clears throat> I'm careful in the language. Mustafa Kamal did not study the Quran. I'm careful with my language. And the, the Turkish people, the scholars of the Turkish people, would be astonished and surprised if they listened to me because they don't know the subject as well. It was Allah in His kindness and grace, who allowed Constantinople to become a Christian city. So the Israelite people in Constantinople were Christians, not Jews. But as Christians, they were obliged to obey the law of the Sabbath. So when some of them went fishing, we don't care for the law anymore. What happened? Surah Al-Araf went on to explain that some of the Christians began to warn their brothers of this violation of the law of the Sabbath. Be warned, Allah is going to punish you. <clears throat> but another group of Christians who had the insight to understand what had happened namely that the Dajjal had corrupted these people. That second group said, you're wasting your time. These people have gone past the point of no return. <laughs> and what was the divine response? And this is critically important now for our subject. Allah punished them. 
אני שואל, כונו קיללתן חסיין, בי אפס, תספייז, בי אפס, בנדר, תספייז. Can a human being be transformed into a monkey? Yes, I know Allah can do everything, but Allah will not, con- will not contradict himself. Yes, Allah can do everything, but Allah will not contradict himself. So can a human being be transformed into a monkey? No. A human being remains a human being until judgment day. And he stands before Allah for judgment as a human being. So when you go and you study your tafsir, remember my words. So what, what, what does it mean? Be apes despise. Allah speaks in the Quran. about people who have eyes and they yet can't see. They have ears, they can't hear, they have hearts, they don't understand. He says, Ulaika kal anam, they are just like cattle. He said, they are like a donkey. Kamathal al-himar. They said, they are like a dog. But he never said they are a dog. He never said he's a donkey. He never said he's a cattle. But here he says, be a despise my understanding and Allah knows best is that this unique language in the Quran is meant to deliver the mother of all messages to you concerning the stamp on the face of the civilization and The divine stamp which has been placed on the face of the civilization which declares we don't care for the law anymore so a man can marry another man and get a marriage to get so it is indicative not that these people are going to be transformed into monkeys but rather they are destined to live like monkeys Monkeys don't wear any clothes, do they? No. They're naked. But that's their fitra. That's their way of life. But this civilization is destined to take off its clothes. Public nudity. I was here in Glasgow, and I took for a walk behind my hotel. There was the Botanic Gardens. And I saw Michelangelo 500 years ago. He made a sculpture of a prophet of Allah. David, the king and the prophet, Nabi Dawood al-Islam. And it was recognized as a historic work of art by this civilization. And uh, it's difficult for us to use these words in public, but I have no alternative. Michael Angelo presented Nabi Dawood al-Islam stark naked, which his genitals be exposed. No civilization in history will ever do, do such a sacrilegious thing. No civilization. And yet this civilization commended it and it's a historic work of art. What Michelangelo did with Nabi Dawood. And today you see that this civilization is exporting its nakedness to the rest of mankind. Yes. Monkeys do their bedroom work in public. But there's nothing shameful and despicable about that. That's their way of life. That's their fitra. 
But when Allah says, be apes despised, it indicates that this civilization will eventually engage in sexual relations in public. And therefore living like monkeys. That is the stamp, the divine stamp, which has been placed on this civilization, which broke away from Constantinople, 1054. Within 40 years of the Great Schism, it took just 40 years, <coughs> and then we see another actor at work. There are two major actors in Akhir Zaman. One is the, the false messiah, Antichrist, Dajjal, and the other is Gog and Magog. And within 40 years, we see Gog and Magog at work. Because in 1090, the Pope in Rome declared war on the first crusade was organized and an army left Europe to fight and conquer the Holy Land. And this was Gog and Magog. I have been teaching the subject of Gog and Magog for 25 years now. And I, my, my success rate in 25 years is zero. When I go in the grave, I'll take with me zero. Nobody agrees with me amongst the scholars. Well, Imran, if nobody agrees with you amongst the ulama, why don't you simply shut up and go home and eat some biryani? <laughs> no. I was not trained that way. I was trained that when you perceive the truth and you recognize it as the truth, then even if you have to be one solitary voice, you must proclaim the truth. And on Gog and Magog, I have done that. And 25 years later, the young ones are now accepting that I'm correct. But no prominent alim or no prominent Darululum would ever agree with me. I'll leave my this world and go from this world and they still will reject me. Who are Gog and Magog? Because now we see this civilization which has broken away broken away from Constantinople, exhibiting power and using power to enforce itself upon others. And that's Gog and Magog. I have created creatures of mind so powerful that none but I can destroy them. This is Sahih Muslim, Hadith of Sahih Muslim, Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are located in two verses, two places of the Quran. In the first one, in Surah al kaf we get the geographical location of Gog and Magog. And in Surah al kaf we are told that Gog and Magog are going to be contained twice, checkmated twice. Twice. The first one, sometime in history. And the geographical location began in the Black Sea. And the second time, the power will re-emerge in the Black Sea, Zul Karnain, two currents, two currents. And from that region of the Black Sea will emerge a power which will checkmate Gog and Magog for a second time. And for me, that is Min Kabul, or Min Bad, the second victory of Rome, is that one that's coming. And it is Russia. Orthodox Christian Russia, which is no longer a communist state. It is now returning to its Orthodox Christian heart. 
where a man cannot marry a man and get a marriage certificate. It is that Russia which will be successful in Ukraine. And when that success takes place, we the believers will celebrate. But now let's go back to Surat al -Kaf. And Gog and Magog are human beings because they commit facade. I don't need to spend time to explain that to you. Facade is that which corrupts to such an extent it can destroy. And they destroy, they corrupt agriculture. They corrupt education. They corrupt the political system. They corrupt the economic system. They corrupt money. I can spend another one hour, two hours explaining to you the corruption of money. They corrupt everything. <clears throat> and they corrupt it to the extent that they destroy it. But when we... I, I, I'm certainly not giving you adequate information on Gog and Magog there, but I have to proceed with the lecture. In the second part of the Quran, Surah al Anbiya, where I now have to devote a little time, and I want you to listen carefully. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Allah speaks of a town. And you have to think to recognize which town it is. And he destroyed the town. And he always destroyed the town because of wickedness. And he expelled the people of that town from the town. And then he placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim this town as their own until Hatta Waharamun ala Kariyatin Ahlaknaha Annahum la yirji'oon. This is Surah Al-Anbiya. Remember, <coughs> Anbiya. That the people have been expelled and they are banned from ever returning to reclaim this town as their own. Hatta. Until when? Iza futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj. When Gog and Magog are released from the barrier bit by Zulkarnay, with iron and copper. This is Surah Al-Kaf. Hatta is a footy had ya'juju or ma'juj. When Gog and Magog are released, then something will happen only once in history. So you, you really have to be eating biryani and going home and sleep to miss it. It happens only once in history. That when Gog and Magog are released, for whom min kulli hadabin yansirun, they're going to spread out all over the world with their indestructible power. Therefore, they'll take power over the world. And this is the power which will corrupt and destroy. They will then use that power to bring these people back to this town to reclaim it as their own. Which town is it? My audience here doesn't need any more information. You've already <laughs> recognized which town is it. But let us do a little bit more. Allah, Allah's messenger told us that when Gog and Magog are released, the ge geography of the Quran is in the north. The, the Black Sea here, the Caspian Sea there, the Caucasus Mountains. And that's the geography of the Quran. The Gog and Magog will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem, on their way to Jerusalem, and they start to drink the water. Not this, <laughs> meaning utilize the water, consume the water. 
And by the time the last of them passed, they will say there used to be water here. And there is the other hadith. When Nabi Isa al-Islam returns, he will pray to Allah to destroy them. And they will be destroyed in Jerusalem. What more do you need? What more do you need to recognize that the town is Jerusalem? And Allah was speaking about the Jews who were expelled and banned for 2,000 years from returning to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. Today they're back in Jerusalem. Who brought them back? There's some people who are afraid to think. <laughs> they are actually afraid to think because they know that if they think, life is going to become difficult for them. These are people who have sold their souls to shaitan. Living in Britain is more important to them than being faithful to the Quran. They've sold their souls to shaitan. And I make no apologies. They can be hang angry with me as they want. I'm not in any popularity contest. I'm here to proclaim the truth regardless of consequences. So Gog and Magog are firmly located in modern Western civilization. They control power in the modern West. But the world of Islamic scholarship does not agree with me. But I will go with my grave. I will go in my grave proclaiming that from the Quran I've got the view Gog and Magog are those who control power in modern Western civilization. And we wait for judgment day. We wait for judgment day when they will have to stand up before the Lord God and explain their betrayal of the Quran. Our prophet complained. <laughs> Surah to the Surah to the Furqan Waqal al Rasul and the Messenger of Allah has said, Ya Rab Inna Kaumi Takadu Hadal al Quran Mahjura. My people have forsaken this Quran. And so what we have so far now is that jo modern Western civilization originated from Constantinople with the Christendom, which betrayed the law of the Sabbath. We no longer have to bother about the law. We now have the truth. Does Allah then curse them? They broke away from Constantinople with the shirk, overt shirk. The, the, the Holy Spirit has come from both the Father and the Son. And when they broke away from Constantinople, Gog and Magog immediately appeared. In the same Surah al Araf, as soon as Allah spoke about this Sabbath, and he cursed them to live like apes. The next ayah, the next verse, wa is ta'azzana rabbuka. Your Lord has now announced, Elankia, your Lord has now announced, wa is ta'azzana rabbuka layaba'athanna, layaba'athanna alayhim. That Allah will now send against those people who fished on the Sabbath. Those who will punish them until judgment day with the worst punishment possible. This verse is telling us that modern Western civilization now has a stamp of Dajjal on it. 
that Dajjal is the one who is, who is fashioning this civilization and using it to fulfill his mission. And number two, that Gog and Magog are located in this civilization. They control power in this civilization. The scientific and technological revolution can be explained from the Quran, but I need to go to other verses, and that's going to take time. That's going to take time. So I'm going to confine myself simply to Dajjal and to Gog and Magog. If I had the time, I'd go to Suleiman al-Islam, I go to his throne, I go to the Jasad on his throne, I go to the Dua of Suleiman al-Islam, and then Allah responds, and the Shayateen of the Jinn are ordered to work for him. That's going to take time to tell you. The, the, the extra, or rather, the cosmological, the cosmological explanation of the scientific and technological revolution. I am sure that there are scholars in Scotland who have done work on that subject. Scotland is, Scotland is not an ordinary place. Eh? I am sure that you have Scottish scholars who have worked on this subject. The cosmological explanation of the scientific and technological revolution. Now then we turn to the last part of the subject. What is the destiny of modern Western civilization? Hmm? The verse of the Quran in Surah Al Mursalat In Taliku Ila Zidrin the proceed to a shadow we shall have three parts it's a verse which has to be interpreted you must not be afraid to interpret but you must be careful to build your interpretation on solid foundation the famous the commentator of the Quran, Imam Zamakshari, he said beautifully so. He said, build from the foundation of the Muhkama to interpret the Mutashabiha. Beautifully spread, beautifully spoken. So I have interpreted, in Taliku ila zillin zi sala se proceed to a shadow we should have three parts. And I say this pertains to Dajjal. And uh, the trademark of Dajjal is everything is in three parts. And our prophet confirmed that when he said that when Dajjal is released, he live on earth for 40 days, one day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest like our days. So I say that the shadow will continue to appear in three parts. And after the three parts are over, then the shadow will disappear and the person will appear in person. In the first part of the shadow, Pax Britannica came into being. The beginning of the process to bring the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. And if you've done your homework, you will know what was the role of Britain if you've done your homework. So you see this, um, you see this machine here? I, I never wanted to get it at all. <laughs> I never wanted it. I always had a small phone, but now the small phone can't be used anymore. I, I, I haven't learned to use it, but this takes up all your time. Mm -hmm. Yes. The Jal is laughing when he gets you to use all your time here. You don't even have time to recite the Quran. If I come in Ramadan to deliver that lecture, you will understand what is your duty to the Quran. You have to think in this first part 
of the shallow, he gave us Pax Britannica. And when you think you recognize what is the role that Britain played to bring the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own and for the state of Israel to be restored. In the second part of the shadow, we got Pax Americana. This was written 20-something years ago eh, in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, 20-something years ago. And you still have not found one solitary scholar of Islam prominent to come forward and declare, say something about this book. They're silent. They don't want to attack it, and they don't want to confirm it. They just remain silent. Yes. Pax Americana continued where Pax Britannica ended. The destiny of modern Western civilization is that Pax Americana has to go with the sunset. And when Pax Americana disappears with the sunset, that's the end of the modern West. Because Dajjal has, need, has no need for them anymore. This is a secular civilization. This is a godless civilization. This is a decadent. Give me the Urdu word for decadent. Badmash? Decadent. Bohut gandagi hai. What is decadent? Huh? All right, you don't know Urdu, never mind. <laughs> This is a decadent civilization. And the Jal has no further use for modern Western civilization. So the Great War which is coming, in which weapons of mass destruction will be used, because that's the only way that is the only way that ninety nine percent of all combatants will be killed. Who said that? Yes, our prophet said that they will fight for the mountain of gold, but we can't give a lecture on monetary economics today. They will fight for that mountain of gold and 99 out of every 100 who fight for it will be killed. So it cannot be conventional warfare. It has to be war warfare with weapons of mass destruction. So I am suggesting to you, I have a book entitled The Quran, The Great War and the West. We will have it here for you in Ramadan, inshallah. So, the, the war which is coming is going to be sunset for the modern West. What remains of modern Western civilization after the Great War will play no significant role in world affairs. That's the destiny of modern Western civilization. Why? Because there is a third part of the shadow. And in that third part, the Jal now establishes Pax Judaica. So that Israel can now seek to replace the United States of America as the ruling state in the world. Uh, I think I, 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 am, I don't need to proceed further than this because this will be an endless lecture. Um, I have adequately explained to you the origin and the destiny of modern Western civilization based on the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet of Islam. How much time we have? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. I'm sorry I took so much time. <laughs> we have 20 minutes uh, for questions and answers. But if you want after Salat, or if you want to postpone the Salat for half an hour or so, we can do that. Uh, the Imam will have to decide. Um, I can give you this time now for questions and answers, inshallah. Nobody. Can I? Hey, thank you very much for a very. Remember, my hearing is declining. Thank you for a good lecture.
Thank you for a very good lecture. You made, web, uh, you made mention earlier of weapons of mass destruction and the use of weapons of mass destruction. Um, there's a belief that if one country launches weapons of mass destruction, everyone else subsequently launches ma weapons of mass destruction, and that subsequently le leads to the end of humanity. So how could you say that with the use of weapons of mass destruction from this, after this mountain of gold, itself ensured human destruction? So how can humanity theoretically continue? It's, yeah. it's no data or science yeah. to suggest that if everyone launches weapons of mass destruction, yeah. one out of yeah. 100. The nuclear scientists, um, who in fact on military um, analysts, they tell us this is the doomsday war, that all of mankind will perish. But we have Islamic eschatology that they don't have. We have Nabi Muhammad who knows more than they do. They have vilified him for hundreds of years. <laughs> They've vilified him. They've said he's the Antichrist and so on. But truth will prevail. And I'm giving you one prophecy of his to indicate that no, all of mankind will not perish. Um, his companion Mu'az ibn Jabal was sitting with him anhu, and asked about the the sequence of events in the end time and this was his reply Umran ubaytul maqdis karabu yakhrit when you see Jerusalem at center stage in the world, look to Medina and you see Medina in forlorn desolation. That is the sign. When you see Medina playing absolutely no role in world affairs, it's in forlorn desolation, the next event to take place would be the Malhama or the Great War. But then he went on to say, Khurujul Malhama Fatul Constantinia. After, meaning A F T E R, after. Eh? You understand the meaning of after? You do? All right. And in Turkey also? You surely understand it? <laughs> Turkey. After. After the Great War, he said, after the Great War, let me say it one more time. He says, after the Great War, there will be the conquest of Constantinople. Kurujul Malhama Fatul Constantinia. And you know why? A Muslim army will conquer Constantinople. When I went to Moscow, they were dazzled. They didn't hear this before. Nobody ever told them. The reason why he praised that army and he praised that commander, he said, La al Constantinia, you will most certainly conquer Constantinople. Wala ni'mal amir wa amiruha wala ni'mal jaysh wa dhalikal jaysh. And he praised the commander and he praised the army. A Muslim army which will conquer Constantinople. Because when we conquer Constantinople, we will return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. And no one can stop it. I have to raise my voice to put terror in their hearts. Terror! We're coming! A Muslim army is coming and you cannot stop it. And when we conquer Constantinople, we will return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. 
Don't stop your arguments. Stop this rubbish that the Sultan bought. He paid for it. He paid for the Hagi as well. Take that rubbish and throw it in a garbage bin. I get very angry on this subject. And I want you to see my anger. So there's going to be a Muslim army which will conquer Constantinople after the Great War. Uh, one hadith says seven months, the other hadith says seven years. And if you're alive, I hope you'll be in that army and conquer Constantinople because NATO won't be around anymore to control the Bosphorus. After the Great War, and after the conquest of Constantinople, only then would Dajjal be released in human form, appear in human form. He's here already, but not in human form. So Pax Judaica will continue until after the conquest of Constantinople. And only when Dajjal appears in human form, then the third part of the shadow has ended. The shadow is gone, and he appears in person next. Yeah. Um, thank you for your lecture. It's uh, very illuminating. Uh, I've a few parts to the question. One, I just want to confirm that you're saying that Sultan Fatih, this is a historical, you're saying that this has nothing to do with the conquering of Constantinople, as you've been talking. It's just, it's just an accident of history, is that you're saying? It's just. I spell the word. I said A. F-T-E-R. So the conquest of Constantinople in 1493, 1453, had nothing to do okay. with the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad. Go ahead. Okay. So the, the other issue is that some hadiths and people will tell me that Rome has yet to be conquered by the Muslims. So you're saying that Rome is Constantinople. So forget about the Rome that we know of. From where? From where did this come? That Muslims have to conquer Rome. From where did it come? I never heard it before. And I'm past 80 years of age now. I still have my thinking cap on. From where has it come? Tell me from where has it come that Muslims have to conquer Rome? <laughs> Tell me, I don't know, I never heard it. There is a grave of uh, Hazrat Abu. Are you following up for his I'm, question? I am not actually, but there's a grave of Hazrat Abu. Uh, this was Prophet's, uh, uh, the person. Abu Ayyub al Ansari is buried in, um, in um, Constantinople, yes, I know that, but that's not. The Quran. My analysis is built on the word of Allah. So even if you come with a bulldozer, you cannot challenge it. You have to bring the Quran now to challenge my analysis. This is what I learned from my teacher, and he learned it from Iqbal. This is not the way of the Darul Loom. Go ahead, next question. Uh, can I just yeah. ask just yeah, go ahead. a little part of um, Obviously, you're speaking to a Muslim audience. You must have spoken to Orthodox Christians. What is their reaction when they hear what you're saying? I much prefer, I much prefer to talk to the Orthodox Christians. <laughs> I much prefer, oh yes. The Orthodox Christians listen to me better than the Muslims. I enjoy being with them and they are absolutely astonished. Nobody ever told them that this is in the Quran. Nobody ever told them that. We always go with boxing gloves. <coughs> take the shahada, take the shahada. No wisdom in our way. So I have, in my own people, they shut the doors of the masjid on me. Yeah. I'm waiting for judgment day. I'm waiting for judgment day. So I have much, I have a happier time to be with the Orthodox Christians, yeah. Yes. 
Um, where, where, someone from the masjid, come forward, please. Someone from the masjid. You've said in the past that in order for Pax Judaica to prevail, the scale of the world must be radically reduced. And it would appear that, as you've said over the many years, that the West and Russia are being conducted towards the Mahamal. This is a concerted effort to bring the Mahamal upon us. What's your feeling on Putin? Is, is he, there's a great debate as to whether he is a knowing participant in this, and it might be the, the Jewish group, Chabad, for example, that has the ear of both the West and Russia. Do you feel Putin is a genuine Orthodox Christian, or is he in some way involved in this orchestration attempt? I have learned to use the absolute truth in the Quran as a means to which I analyze political affairs and economic affairs and monetary affairs and so on. And uh, it took me some time, despite the superb training I got from my teachers, it took me some time <laughs> to understand the Soviet Union. Yes, the Soviet Union played a very, very uh, a role in history that is very difficult to understand, very difficult to understand. And I don't have the time now to explain that, but I've done it in several lectures. What we see is a process of change taking place in Russia, divinely ordained, to bring Russia to where it is today, after the episode of an atheist Soviet Union. So when looking at that movement of history as it pertains to Russia and the Orthodox Christian world. When we recognize that movement of history, it is not difficult to conclude that Russia today is on the right side of history. <coughs> the names are not important whether it be Putin or somebody else, Russia is on the right side of it. I wish I had more time to answer your question, but it's difficult to do all of this in one lecture. Next question. Uh, the question is, actually, there are two northern races which have dominated the planet over the last 1,000 years. Uh, one of them is from uh, uh, this Mongolia all the way to Central Asia, north of Caucasus. So these are yeah. Mongols, Tatars, and uh, 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 Turkic tribes, um, in which Khazar also probably fall. So all of these. And then there are Northern uh, European, which are from uh, uh, these uh, Scandinavian, uh, northwest of Russia, northwest of Ukraine, and these Germanic tribes, which also originated uh, in the similar location. And then they moved uh, uh, southward, so they came and Franks, they are also Germanic and, uh, and uh, the Scandinavians and they've taken over France and rest of the Europe. So, I mean, these two people have, from the north, they've dominated the planet. Original, uh, initial three, four hundred years were Tatars, Turks and, uh, and Mongols, and then these are the Westerns. And the Western actually have been dominated uh, all along, but now the whole planet is dominated by these Western people which originate in the north. Which of them are Gog and Magog? Are all of them? Are uh, these Khazars uh, are the more pure core of these Gog and Magog? Or uh, which of them? Because these are the people who... I am not <laughs> boasting, because when you boast, a lot takes away your knowledge. <laughs> but when I started on this journey, 
1972, at the age of 30. I um, was given a scholarship to study international relations at the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies. I came first in the class and then they gave me a scholarship to go to do the PhD in Geneva. In the 1970s, there were no scholars, none, anywhere in the world, who had expertise in eschatology. And I made the mistake of choosing a PhD thesis topic, a post-caliphate Islam, post-caliphate Islam, and the search for a new Islamic public order. <coughs> and there were no scholars anywhere in the world. It took me about 30 years before I was blessed by Allah to pioneer Islamic eschatology. I am the pioneer. But Alhamdulillah, I see students arising, some of them more brilliant than me. <laughs> yes, mashallah. So what I have presented to you is the limit of Islamic scholarship on Gog and Magog. I cannot proceed beyond what I have to identify them any more than what I have identified them. I have said to you that Gog and Magog are located in modern Western civilization. Number one, I have said to you that Gog and Magog are those who control power in modern Western civilization. I'm not prepared to proceed beyond that. There are others who come after me and they may wish to do more than that. That's the limit at which I'm going to stop. Yeah? We have sisters at the back. If any sister wants to ask a question, There's an opportunity to ask, so okay. Um, in terms of the Muslim army conquering Constantinople, um, I always interpret, this is my interpretation of it, is that it was the... Uh, you always interpret it as? as? As it was part of the Osmania, you know, tribe that um, conquered, that was the Muslim army that con conquered Constantinople. Now the conquest of Constantinople is connected with the Ottoman Empire? No, that's my interpretation of, of the Osmania uh, tribe. The, the Osmania tribe meaning by that the Ottoman, yes, Ottoman yeah, Empire. Ottoman, yes. That they are what somehow or the other connected with the conquest of Constantinople. That's what you're saying? Yes. That's what you're saying? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's what Turkey says. That's what Turkey says. That's what the Ottoman Empire said for 600 years. That the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad to Islam of a conquest of Constantinople in Akhir Zaman was fulfilled mm -hmm. by the Sultan Muhammad Fatih in 1453. My scholarship had challenged that. I started in 2011 with a lecture at the International Islamic University in Malaysia with about a thousand students present. As my message reaches mankind, the numbers of people who come to listen to me become less and less and less and less. Until tomorrow, nobody will want to listen to me. <laughs> At that time, there were a thousand students in the masjid. Mm -hmm. And I spoke on the conquest of Constantinople in Akhir Zaman. And there were six Turkish professors sitting in front of me. They were astonished because they had all been brainwashed, brainwashed, that the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad was fulfilled in 1453. Mm -hmm. I have the evidence to provide, to prove to you that this is false. Number one, yes. that the conquest of Constantinople will take place after the Great War. <coughs> A F T E R. The Great War has not yet taken place. So <laughs> they're wrong. We could go beyond that, but we don't have the time. Sister has a question at the back. I just want to know that the time when it says in the hadith to leave for the mountain, is that after the war 
or no? Whether the hadith about a believer will have to flee to the mountain sides and places where rain falls and take with him some sheep and goat in order to preserve his religion. Will this prophecy be fulfilled after the Great War or before the Great War? Is that the question? Yes. That's the question. My view is that uh, <coughs> this prophecy is already being fulfilled in some parts of the world. Already being fulfilled. Uh, I have to share with you <coughs> that modern Western civilization is also praying God. This used to be Christendom. And Christendom says that the divine rights of kings, that the king is in the place of the, God, the Lord God. <coughs> the king is in the place of the Lord God. So you have to obey the king. But they don't say that anymore. The prime minister is now God himself. The parliament is now God himself. They don't believe in God anymore. And what do I do? I say, if the government and the state makes a law which is in conflict with Allah's law, I am not going to bend in submission to the government. I will not do it. Forgive my language. The sheep and the cattle could do it if they want. But I will not do it. So when the government said, you cannot enter the masjid or the temple or the church unless you have on a face mask. I said, and then I will not enter the masjid. Because you cannot make the law for the house of God. You're not Lord. You're not God himself. <coughs> it is something called Bidah. And the prophet said about Bidah that this is a hellfire. This is the house of God. So I have never, never, never entered a masjid anywhere in the world with a face mask. Never. But those who want to obey the government rather than Allah, that's their choice. They worship the government rather than Allah. I know that my words are going to cause hurt now for some people. But you ask the question. When the government says you, you cannot pray shoulder to shoulder, but Allah's messenger said you must pray shoulder to shoulder and if you leave any space, shaitan will fill that space. The government said you are not allowed to pray that way. You have to stand three feet apart or six feet apart and so on. Who should I obey, the government or Allah and his messenger? Allah and his messenger. I said I'm not going to obey the government. So I have never participated in any of that Bogus Salat. Bogus Salat. I'm not going to do it. And if I find an Imam who has consented to having this Salat three feet or five feet apart and has not made Toba, then I expect that when COVID-2 comes, as it's coming, he'll do the same thing again. And when COVID-3 comes, he'll do the same thing again. But so far, the government has not taken any action against me. <coughs> this is my defiance. I'm not going to worship the government. I worship Allah. Or what do I do when they start to persecute me? Once you stand up for the truth, they're going to come after you. And my answer is, if I have to flee to the mountain sides, and places where rain falls and take with me some sheep and goats. I prefer to do that rather than to uh, abandon the truth which has come from Allah and His Messenger and obey those who are praying God. So this prophecy is already being fulfilled today because the Arabs 
for being terrorized like this. You can't even grow a beard. Well, I have not faced anything like what the Arabs have faced and are still facing. Next. I think